Dr. Megan Jacob is an Associate Professor of Clinical Microbiology and the Director of Diagnostic Laboratories at NC State College of Veterinary Medicine. She came to Raleigh after completing her undergraduate education in microbiology at the University of Wyoming and her MS and PhD work in veterinary pathobiology at Kansas State University. Her graduate research programs were focused on epidemiology and ecology of foodborne pathogens, particularly E. coli 0157 and Salmonella in feedlot cattle. Megan's continued research interests are in transmission dynamics of pathogenic bacteria, specifically those in publicly attended livestock interactions. She has also developed a research program in veterinary diagnostic microbiology focusing on diagnosing and monitoring antimicrobial resistant bacteria in animal populations. She is engaged with projects to expand diagnostic opportunities and surveillance systems through the U.S. and globally. Megan coordinates the bacteriology and mycology instructions of veterinary students, participates in guest lectures to undergraduate and graduate students in the food science and microbiology curriculum, and serves on numerous college and departmental committees. Committees. Megan will be completing the enteric pathogen testing for the NOMS GOAT 2019 study. Dr. Megan Jacobs. Thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you all. I think my role is partially motivator and partially question answer and maybe partially beggar. <laughs> so I hope to share with you some thoughts on the importance of the fecal enteric pathogen work. Doesn't need to come down. a little closer. Yeah, try that. See how it works. Super awkward about that. Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, so I. I'm going to, to talk a little bit about it in the context. Uh, I'll try to acknowledge some of the food safety aspects of it, but I think some of those are well known and consistent across different animal populations. So I think what makes goats a little bit unique is this um, public health because of contact at publicly attended livestock interactions, petting zoos, state fairs, things like that. Um, and, and as was mentioned earlier, a lot of our um, operators use these activities to supplement income and so we recognize that importance. So a little bit of context, uh, I grew up raising sheep which I feel like is admitting something bad in this audience because my experience other than Tom suggests that sheep and goat people really don't like each other that much but uh, my, my maid of honor was a goat person so maybe that gives me some credibility. <laughs> Um, so I was interested in microbiology and animal populations for a long time and, and I'm a huge advocate of engaging the public in agriculture and these livestock groups. So I think we need to do our best to answer some of these questions and get data but not scare people. Um, so when I did my PhD it was in feedlot cattle which Kansas has a lot of and then I moved to North Carolina which has not so many cattle but um, sadly when I moved there in 2011 they had their second state fair outbreak which actually cost a small child his life. Shortly after that we had Cleveland County Fair and even as early as last year I took a call from uh, a family member that raised goats and her son was had or her not her son her nephew had HUS and was in the hospital because of E. coli. So certainly in that area, uh, this is a, a huge problem. Um, we've done work going to processing plants, halal plants, and commercial plants to sample uh, goat feces, carcasses, and try to understand what the epidemiology is in those environments. So from a meat safety side. The good news is when most people consume goat, they like it well cooked. So that's different than a lot of our hamburger talks. Um, so it doesn't tend to be a huge problem in terms of undercooked meat. Certainly raw and under processed milk products are another story. Um, but we've, we've done some of that work and then we've done some work to look at the SRP vaccine, which is a vaccine for use in cattle to control E. coli 0157, and if we can apply that to goats to control the pathogen there. So that's the background of where I came from. In 2017, a colleague of mine, Dr. Ben Chapman, and I hosted 44 North Carolina goat producers to a conference to understand what their concerns were, what their knowledge base was about uh, agritourism risks, pathogen risks, biosecurity, disease prevention. It was hugely enlightening to us. They were desperate for information, were kind of actively working to give them a tool or at least to give it to extension agents or other people that could deploy it into the field so that these operators can actually 
assess what their risk might be and make better choices based on best management practices. So things like where you're storing your manure, are we allowing people to pick strawberries while the goats are walking through the fields, that sort of thing. Um, so active, I guess, in that area. And I also have a hobby farm and like to take pictures of kids doing stupid things with goats that would involve a public health transmission risk aspect to it. So that's the context. Um, I think most of what I'm going to cover is probably stuff you all had in vet school. So it's just a re refresher or reminder. At the end, I'll try to get to the specific enteric pathogens that we're really interested in for this study and some uh, understanding of why and maybe what turnaround time and results mean in that context. If that's okay. Okay, so from uh, an enteric fecal pathogen perspective, bacteria-wise, we're not really that concerned about the presence of a lot of organisms in terms of animal health. Certainly with parasites, that's a little bit different, uh, but we don't see a lot of E. coli, Salmonella, Campylobacter, certainly not Enterococcus disease because of it, so we're really looking at the public health aspect of what these organisms mean. And we're concerned because we know that they're zoonotic and they can be shared with people, and not just bacteria can be shared, but fungus and parasites like Crypto and Giardia, Giardia which is also included in this uh, program. And zoonotic pathogens are very common, so six out of ten infectious diseases in people are attributed to zoonotic pathogens, and really importantly, especially when you talk to producers is their animals won't appear sick. These are normal animals. They're carrying these organisms perfectly normally in their gastrointestinal tract. So there's no negative consequences to those animals for having it. In fact, we expect them to do that. But it makes it difficult um, when we talk to operators when their goats don't look sick, but we tell them that the bacteria that they're carrying make people sick. And with some of the organisms that I'm going to talk about, specifically the generic E. coli and Enterococcus, really not in terms of an infectious agent, a risk for making people sick either, but they are an important reservoir for antimicrobial resistance, and they help with our surveillance and stewardship efforts in that area. So who is at risk for zoonoses? And you all know this and could come up with this list, but it's going to be young children, typically less than five years old, uh, which, by the way, is who we usually take to attend like livestock interactions to pet the goats. Um, adults greater than 65, immunocompromised people, so they could be immunocompromised because of infectious disease, immune system, cancer patients, or pregnant women. So these are really vulnerable, at risk, and not very tol tolerable populations to make sick or have more severe consequences. So in um, developed populations like the United States, those people represent, sorry, I hit the wrong button, 15 to 20 percent of our population would be considered at risk. So other factors that we might not even consider, but that would also make somebody susceptible of malnutrition, use of antacids, which just raises your stomach acid, so we're not killing those things on the way through, uh, increased circulating iron, fatty acids, ingestion of large volumes of water and transplant recipients. So although it's easy to say we want to make recommendations just based off of age or some other status. There's a lot of things that can predispose people to becoming sick with zoonotic agents. Um, and some of that is really well studied and accepted and understood. So we have a lot of folks now that have general immunosuppression because of either immune diseases or drugs that are knocking down the immune system. And when we do that, it actually takes a lot fewer number of organisms to cause people to be ill. Um, but interestingly, and when I talk to operators, something that comes up that we have just really started to understand is that the people that we are bringing from urban environments into interactions with livestock actually fundamentally have a different immune system than the people that are raised in these environments. So that's probably something we all would have guessed, but there's actually now a lot of science that suggests that that is true, you have a more robust exposure, you have a more robust immune system. And the folks that don't get those exposures to these common enteric or zoonotic organisms are going to be more susceptible. Which fits into one of my favorite topics, the hygiene hypothesis. Um, and I think, again, you'll start to see this increasingly accepted. So we have to consider how we're going to manage the risk of that differently for the populations that are contacting those animals every day versus the ones that are just sort of transiently exposed to, to animals. 
So the conclusions from that the science would suggest so far is that there's strong evidence that ties the immune status with the susceptibility of foodborne pathogens and zoonoses, and that immune status, although we usually like to classify it by young and old and pregnant, uh, can actually be a lot more complicated, and, and it's not easy to look at somebody and be able to judge that. There's evidence that the immune system fun function differs between those exposed to farm environments, often and at an early age, and that there's an increasing amount of immunocompromised people visiting livestock interaction facilities. Okay, so when we look at how zoonotic pathogens are shared, um, most of the time, especially if we were having this conversation with the beef industry, we'd be talking about a foodborne pathogen risk. Um, however, we know that direct contact with animals is an increasingly recognized and reported way by which people are becoming exposed to these zoonotic pathogens. This is the, my, probably the best picture I've ever taken. So that's a little guy who I watched this is a, a state that's actually represented here at a, at a fair. In North Carolina, because we've had such tragic events, you can't even get into the building with animals anymore. But at, at this, you probably know where that is. Anyways, at this event right here, this little guy walked up and picked up the poop and then put it in his mouth. And I was sitting there watching him like, it's like this train wreck, right? You can't, you can't stop it, but you kind of want to. And he's not my kid. And anyways, there's a problem. So, anyways, we have direct contact with the animals or with their specimens. Um, we also have indirect contact, with, which would be ingestion of contaminated food or water products. So, certainly raw milk, we've had a really somewhat famous uh, E. coli and salmonella problem with raw milk dairy goats in North Carolina. Uh, drinking water from those environments, certainly undercooked meat. But we also have ingestion after contact with the environment, which could include the fly that's taken into the ketchup bottle that we're pouring all over our hot, hot dogs, uh, or common um, areas that we've seen people that, that they're just not thinking about these pathogens. It's going to be fence rails, doorknobs, equipment, serving utensils, animal bedding, and contaminated clothing or shoes. In fact, we're doing a study now to look, and we've found the presence of E. coli 0157 on stroller wheels. So people do a really great job of washing their kids' hands after they've pet the goat. They do, actually, they do a lot worse job of washing their own hands. So they assume that the kids are the only dirty people. But then they'll wash their hands, and then they go to the car, fold this down, touch the wheels, and recontaminate themselves. So all of those fomite things in these environments are also really important. Um, also, from, from a food safety or the public health perspective, the role of environmental survival uh, of these pathogens is important. So organisms that exist for a long period of time are going to extend the total risk of those being transmitted to um, a person or to other animals, which will then become carriers for those organisms. So they survive really, really well in a lot of the environments that we raise animals or that we uh, transport animals to. They also can be disseminated in a lot of different routes, like insect vectors, so flies, cockroaches, all of those nasty things have been shown to be positive for these organisms. Rainwater runoff that will go and wash through an area and go and spread the pathogens to another area, physical movement, and dust. So again, uh, it's not just understanding what the role is necessarily with the animals, although that's where you all's questionnaire of management and what they actually mean in individual animals will help us better understand what this environmental presence is and what it means because it's really difficult to sample in those locations. So how well do these zoonotic organisms survive? And it kind of depends on the organism. So something like a virus like influenza is very short, probably only survives minutes. However, Shigatoxin E. coli from uh, an outbreak out east was found 300 days in the sawdust after all animals had been evacuated and they applied two bleach treatments to that area. So it can survive for a really long period of time if the temperature, the, the uh, humidity, and the organic material is right. Salmonella has been shown to survive for months in manure or wooden fencing, and cryptosporidium is gonna be stage dependent, but it can survive several months certainly in the water environment. So those factors that are going to be influencing the presence and persistence of these organisms are the presence of biological material, which is usually manure. By the way, we did another cool study where we, 
because everybody at this livestock interaction event that we had thought that they were controlling foodborne pathogens or E. coli risk essentially by using foot baths. So, it's, so we did a study where we put some E. coli into foot baths to see what they did over time. And as soon as we put one gram of feces into a foot bath, it was completely ineffective. We would get survival of E. coli, which is great. It's not great for the foot bath, but it's great for us to be able to communicate that that's not an effective way for us to manage uh, the presence of these organisms in those environments. So any biological material like manure is going to really protect and encourage the growth of those organisms. Temperature, humidity and moisture, acidity, and which microorganism we're talking about. Am I? Yeah. Say that again. So we did uh, um, like an HDQ, Vircon, hydrogen peroxide, and bleach. So we did four different compounds. And we did the foot baths, we did a rubber-based foot bath that has like the, I don't know how to describe it, like the little spikes that come up that you would bristle your feet off with. And we applied wood shavings, just like that we got and sterilized from tractor supply. And then we got goat feces and put it in there and we did those combinations. And is all of those combinations equal mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, well, I know this is, I'm going to go down a tangent here. I think if they were like single use products, it's a reasonable way to reduce. But people don't use them as single use products. It's like, here's your bleach bath that everybody's going to walk through for the entire day. And so, probably after the first time or two, you're not even getting a three log reduction anymore. Okay. Any other questions? Hopefully, this is hitting the mark a little bit. So the other thing that we're beginning to understand, although we know very little about these foodborne pathogens outside of food processing environments, is the role of bacterial biofilms. And actually in the foot bath study, this is what I was more interested in. I expected it to work, but that maybe we would get a selective pressure for bacteria to form biofilms. Um, so these are essentially bacterial communities that coat themselves in the sticky, sugary substance so that they are impermeable by things that we apply to them. So the disinfectants or antibiotics or any of that. And we know that they occur, like if you think about catheters or scopes or things, that sort of makes sense and is probably intuitive. We know that they occur at food processing plants on the equipment, but we also think that they are occurring at some of our uh, operator sites on fence rails or in foot baths or other surfaces as well. So probably their role in persistence and continual spread of the organism is important. Interestingly, this is not uh, food safety related, but we did just do a study um, with, with um, UPEC, so canine E. coli that cause urinary tract infections. So E. coli is the main point there. And we found that the E. coli that like to form biofilms, they have really little virulence and they have no antibiotic resistance. So it seems as though bacteria choose if they want to do this in an environment that they're not getting a lot of selective pressure, then that's one mechanism that they can use. Or if they're getting a lot of antibiotics thrown at them, they probably won't form biofilm and they'll acquire some genes that make them resistant. So lots to still understand, especially in uh, sort of environmental conditions. So the next few slides are just, I guess, not really to scare you, but just to show you how persistent these organisms can be in, uh, in the environment. So this was samples taken from a building uh, at, a, at a county fair outbreak of E. coli 0157, and they looked at sawdust, they looked at walls, railings, um, bleachers, rafters, and some other environmental samples for 6, 14, and, 30, or and 42 weeks. So in the sawdust in the environment, uh, after 42 weeks, so almost a full year, we still had all of those samples positive for E. coli. So you can apply this to a fair, that's where this data comes from. That's where we have a lot of data that exists because we do outbreak investigations. But this same sort of conversation could be happening with operators about the persistence of the organism. And even if they don't have animals actively shedding, it could be persisting in the environment on properties as well. 
And I love E. coli, so I talk about it a lot, but here's some other zoonotic pathogens that show um, persistence over time. So Salmonella loves to stay around for a while. So um, the prevalence is going to be high, and it's probably going to be there, especially in a non-well aerated area for several months. Uh, Campylobacter and Listeria can do the same. So from the food safety perspective, we don't know, I think we are increasingly understanding the importance of looking for these organisms in raw milk because that is a service in a market that's really popular. Uh, we don't know a lot about the meat risk. Um, we do know that people's behavior around how they use meat is very different from cattle. Um, but really where we have a lot of or increasing amounts of data for what these organisms mean in goats is going to be at public settings like state fairs and those. So these are just some examples of clippings that tell you that those exist. They probably are stressed animals that are going to shed even more of them than they would on their premise. And so we have a large number of naive people that have not the same immune system coming into an area of highly in infectious animals that otherwise don't appear ill, but are going to be shedding more of those organisms. And because of that, uh, we have groups that get together and come out with compendiums that will give basic recommendations on how to handle the organisms in these environments. So uh, the current recommendations based off of that compendium include to control shedding in the organisms from animals. So that's great. I think we should do that. Uh, I would argue we really don't know what it is. So we it's not informed much by data. So what are the control strategies? Like, is vaccination reasonable? Are we going to suggest that we should use antibiotics? Are we going to test and scull? What are we going to do about that? What testing strategies do we do and which organisms are high risk or are we looking for? What management strategies are we using? So what is the stress, handling, transportation, season, and age of the animal? All of which have been linked back to the prevalence of those different pathogens at different times. What is the proper manure disposal? And when we think about manure disposal, we're really worried about runoff. So are we putting manure disposal uphill to when, when we get a rain event, it's all gonna wash back down onto the property or to the area? Um, are we far enough away that we don't have a lot of vectors flies as an example going from place to place. So what is the facility design? What areas can we disinfect? Uh, how much access do we allow people to have? What is the ventilation? And limit animal use space for community events. So these are not mine. The question marks are mine. I think this one's kind of interesting. And even at my vet school now we have goat yoga. So on the hearth every couple of months there's people doing yoga with baby goats running around. And I walk out and I'm like, what could go wrong? What could go wrong with this? But it makes the students feel a little bit less stressed, so we do it. Okay, so the environmental persistence piece can't be predicted by the organism, or can't be really predicted by the organism, but it's probably multifactorial and for a long time. It can be at best controlled with different management strategies. And this is the sort of strategy that we need data to inform. So when we go out to places and we understand how people are using their animals, what biosecurity practices they have, what disinfectant practices they have, all of that, we're getting more data to give more specific management strategies than we can currently do. And I think the risk of not doing this is that we will have people that don't interact with the animals at all because the risk of getting sick is high. So we want to give people practical ways to control the presence of these organisms uh, on their operation or when they travel. Okay, so I'm going to spend the next few minutes, and I apologize, first of all, I guess my mother-in-law is taking my daughter on a trip or something. My phone keeps being beeping, but um, I have to leave at 1.30 because I have to catch a shuttle out here at 1.35. So if you see the green ride people come, just let me know, <laughs> and I'll run out there real quick. But if you have any questions on any of this, I put my contact information at the end. Be happy to talk. If you have producers that are really concerned about something, be happy to talk to them as well. Um, if you have people that maybe aren't part of this, but they want to know about E. coli and their goats, just let us let me know. So the NOMS enteric organisms that we are looking for include generic E. coli. 
Uh, we're going to be looking for shigatoxin E. coli, probably specifically E. coli 0157. That's not part of this project, but we're going to do that as a supplemental piece. Uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Enterococcus, and Giardia and Crypto. So what I would like to do is tell you a little bit about when we think we'll know the results because people get very anxious about what their results are, uh, what I expect the prevalence to be, and maybe a little bit about how you communicate the importance of those findings. So we'll go bug by bug. So generic E. coli, if you go back to your best student days, you know that most animals carry this normally in their gastrointestinal tract. It's a pretty significant component. When we say generic, we're looking for something that doesn't have a lot of virulence factors. So it's just mostly an indication of what's going on in the fecal um, system. So it's relatively easy to grow. We would know, we would have a confirmed positive for sure within three days. Uh, and I expect the prevalence to be 60 to 70%. We don't really have great uh, baseline data, but it's probably going to be pretty high. So what I get most concerned about is making sure that people know that this generic E. coli is not the shigatoxin E. coli that, that people hear about in terms of outbreaks. So that's a completely separate subset. It's not completely separate, but the odds that we would uh, isolate an STEC with the methods that we're looking for the generic E. coli is not good. So we expect it to be there. It's not a concern. In this study, we're using this mostly as a reservoir for antimicrobial resistance to understand what that prevalence is going to be later on. So I think the public health importance is pretty mild. Um, it could be that we get specific sequence or serotypes that are going to have some public health importance, but we're not going that far into classifying them. So people should expect that their animals would have generic E. coli. Um, the shigatoxin E. coli is a little bit more difficult. Anytime you want to find like a specific population of E. coli, it takes a few more steps. So that's looking at probably a week before we would know the outcome of that. Um, I don't expect the prevalence to be high. Based off of the studies at slaughter plants, we probably would expect a fecal prevalence of about 10%. Again, their animals are not going to be clinically ill, so they don't experience bloody diarrhea or kidney disease like people do. One of the challenges here is what do you do with animals that are positive? So um, that's a conversation that might come up. I don't know. I have sort of my opinions on it. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer, but um, I think certainly if you have shigatoxin positives at areas that you have a large amount of public traffic, then that would be something that I would want to at least communicate the potential risk to the producers. So the public health importance of that is going to be potentially high. Salmonella is um, kind of a funny broad bug. So th this is a little bit more difficult for me to give you specific recommendations. All public health people look for salmonella and it makes a lot of people sick every year on food and other products. So it's definitely one we want to include. Um, it takes a little bit longer. So again, we're looking at a full week before we're gonna have a confirmed salmonella. And I think that the prevalence is gonna be pretty low. I would expect it even lower than those shigatoxin E. coli. So, Unless you have new kids um, that are pretty young that have diarrhea, most animals are probably not shedding this uh, asymptomatically, but a few of them will be. The public health importance I put here is moderate. It's really going to be serotype specific. So there's going to be a lot of salmonella that we find that probably is never a risk uh, for people, but certainly if it's a typhimurium or something like that, it could be a problem. So. I think with the low prevalence uh, and the potential serotype distribution, it's a moderate risk. Again, something you would probably want to communicate with on how you want to handle those animals. Um, animals that do start to shed salmonella asymptomatically as adults, they tend to do it. It's really difficult to clear. So I know we have an experience where we have a goat that a uh, goat um, operation that also does pick your own strawberries. That's another topic for another day, but they uh, they have chronically shedding animals with salmonella and they've tried isolating them into different environments, they've tried treating them, and those animals that are shedding are going to persistently shed and so so they had to make a decision on how they wanted to manage that. Um, Campylobacter is probably the organism that I can give you the least amount of information for goats because we don't really look for it or haven't before. 
So it's a tricky bug to grow. It takes a lot of special requirements. So it's going to be over a full week before we really have Campylobacter results finalized. I think the prevalence is probably 1% to 3%. If they have uh, free-range chickens on a premise, it might be a little bit higher. So there's some risk factors for Campylobacter within an environment that we might see that would increase that. And again, I think the uh, public health importance is probably going to be moderate. Again, there's specific species and loads and virulence markers that would determine how severe it was. Um, okay, so the next one on our list is Enterococcus. So Enterococcus, like generic E. coli, it's just the gram-positive equivalent of a, of a bug that lives normally in the gut. There's lots of different Enterococcus species. Um, we're probably going to find the full spectrum. Some of them tend to be virulent. If you all think back, if you had an enterococcus in a urine, you'd probably treat it. So there are certainly some species that do that, but we're going to find a lot of enterococcus you haven't heard about before. If you haven't heard about it, it probably means they're not that important, at least in terms of making animals sick. Why we care so much about enterococcus is they are fantastic at acquiring antibiotic resistance plasmids. They love to do it and they love to share them with anybody that will come into contact with them. They're very promiscuous that way. So they're a really good uh, benchmark for what's going on with AMR. Um, and those are pretty easy to grow, so three days, probably 70 to 80 percent positive. Again, mild public health importance. Um, I can give you situations for all of these that would elevate that, but on the whole we expect all of these animals to have enterococcus and again we're just using it sort of as an indicator surveillance screen, not because the presence of it's particularly uh, risky. Any questions on the bacteria piece? Did that cover everything that you all wanted for the bacteria piece? Okay, so then um, we're sending our the fecal samples that you send to our lab, there's two bags in there. Uh, one is what we're going to use to detect all of those different pathogens. So my plea to you all is that we actually get at least two grams. It's really difficult to try to detect all of these pathogens with one single pellet. So two grams isn't that much. It's kind of like the first two joints of your pinky. So a good five or six pellets is going to be sufficient for us to do that testing. It's difficult if there's just one to Y'all have tried to chop up goat poop, right? Like you can't possibly wedge it into seven different pieces. So anyways, try to get six for here. In a separate bag, you're collecting more if it's available. We are sending those to the USDA in Maryland and they are looking for Giardia and Crypto. So when we get them, we sort them out. We have mailers and we'll handle that piece of it. Um, if the bags are well labeled, both that have the goat names and identifiers on, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, I don't know anything, I mean I have ideas, but I don't really know that we have any information that would guide us to know what the expected prevalence is. Probably crypto is going to be a little bit higher. I don't expect a lot of Giardia, but it's going to be really risk factor dependent. But the public health importance of those could also be high and something you would want to feel comfortable training your folks to communicate back to producers on. So. That is what I had. Here is my email. The only thing I would tell you is I wish that my last name had an S on it because it should be Jacobs. I've tried to tell my husband that. He doesn't agree with me, but anyways. Uh, but if you email Megan Jacobs, it does not actually come to me, and then people are frustrated about that. So uh, and my phone number if you'd like to call and discuss any of those. Be happy to answer questions. Please collect goat poop. It's going to be so helpful in us better providing information to operators on how to manage these enteric organisms in their system. Are yeah? I do. I have 15 minutes, I think, or 10 minutes. Uh, I think we'll be asked how can these groups prevent their bacteria growth? Is there power washing? Is that the best for biofilm? Yep. Yes, physical removal is a great strategy to remove biofilm. So it sort of depends on what their mentality is. There are chemicals that will better degrade biofilms than others, but physical force to remove biofilms is the best thing that you could do. The other thing that I think um, maybe we talk about uh, in our circles, but that I've seen 
operators not understand is cleaning and disinfecting are two different things. So we can't just disinfect um, like straight up manure. If you clean and get rid of the manure and then you disinfect, that's going to be highly effective, but it can't overcome the cleaning aspect of it. So I think that's part of the training as well. The physical removal and cleaning and then coming back in with the chemical product is their best approach. Yeah? You had mentioned that one of the slides that consuming large volumes of water would increase the risk for zoonoses. Is that just because of where the water source is coming from or would it yeah, it's largely where the water source is coming from and um, what the surrounding environment is potentially contaminating the water with. Yep. You said a couple. Do you have more? So you said a couple. Do you have more questions? Uh, yeah, well, it was more about the sawdust and the bedding. Yeah. So are we supposed to be telling them that they need to be changing out the bedding and how frequently? Yeah, I wish that I could tell you that. I would love to to know that. I think at this point all we can say is in these environments sawdust, allow, sawdust does allow these organisms to persist but how long and re specific recommendations for cleaning I don't feel like we have enough data to answer yet so maybe that's like at the risk of not giving people enough information I think some of these holes are potentially recruiting strategies for getting people to participate because it, we can't answer them without some of this basic preliminary information. And something that I think Kath mentioned earlier that is absolutely true is if I go to the other section, I'm sure, but USDA now and ask for money to study goats, it's not really there. So we have to have enough preliminary information to make a case to go and find other pots of money to answer some of those specific questions. Other questions? Awesome. Well, please let me know if you do, and I will look forward to communicating at least back to the NOMS team uh, with all your results. Thank you.